Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Deherrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, first, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers, of course, not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, including me and, you know, hmm? So, if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, other videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I am very honored to welcome Professor Loretta Bruning to the show. Hi, Loretta. Hi. So Loretta is a professor emerita of management at Cal State University East Bay, and also author of, a, of an amazing book called Habits of a Happy Brain. Um, Loretta's story, just the quick background here, um, Loretta has observed a lot of conflict or has observed conflict across societies, regions, and even species, which I find interesting, and developed a new method of mitigating, as I would put this, bad feelings that are brought on by conflict. So I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation. So again, Loretta, thank you so much. Sure. So let me start let me start with kind of a ground level question. You a lot of what is on your website folk kind of kind of uh centers on the idea of conflict. And I'm curious, like how did conflict come into your life like that? How did you become focused on that? So I grew up with a very unhappy mother and oh. Mm, so she created the conflict. I see. And when you're a kid and you're trying to make sense of that, um, on the one hand, you, you don't want to add to the conflict. But sure. on the other hand, you know, I, I didn't really believe the things that she was spewing. <laughs> so I learned to keep my mouth shut, but to think for myself. That would be the short answer. Sure. That's, that's, <laughs> I think that's where many of us struggle because we see the conflict and then we go, well, I've got to say something about this. And then, you know, whatever else happens, you know, the res result. But um, also, um, if I went through life, like blaming everything on her, blaming all conflict on her, is like, that wouldn't do me any good because th what happens is we get wired from early experience. So then... I could go through the rest of my life projecting that conflict onto other people I meet, sure. and then I'm just reactivating it in myself with my own neural pathways and creating my own suffering. But my verbal right. brain can come up with fancy explanations of why it's really this one's fault and that one's fault. So, right. so that took a much longer time to learn that. Yeah. I want to return to that in a moment. Uh, out of curiosity, though, because because I've been in management before, and I've you know much of what I discovered anyway was a lot of management is just managing conflict. Did did that kind of inform your early, did your childhood sort of inform the idea of uh, um, going into thank management? Thank you. That that's a nice logical explanation, but actually, <laughs> the facts are much more complicated. Oh, so. When I was young and I was in this sort of unhappy family, and one good thing happened to us is, long story short, my father got free trips offered to him. And we had, like, no money. But this, so this was like, and, and also my parents were very fearful, so they didn't go out much. So okay. these free trips were, like, sort of mind-blowing for me, you sure. know? And every one of us is wired by the rewards and threats of our past. Because the rewards of your past tell you, oh, that's possible, and that's a way to feel good. So there are millions of ways to feel good, but we all focus on the ones that we just happened to experience when we were young. So I sort of got addicted to travel, you would say. And then when I was in college, I looked for a way to make a future out of that. 
So I was in international management. So that's the, the short answer. And it was really the international part that I was focused on. <laughs> but I guess I had this, like I associate management with psychology. And I wanted yes. to study psychology because, to help understand my emotions, as most people in it. But on mm. the other hand, I never wanted to be in any kind of counseling role to listen sure. to other people's sure. stuff. That was not my interest at all because I had grown up listening to my mother's stuff. So, so I mean, introspection played a significant role in your, I mean, must have played a significant role in your development. I mean, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? I mean, the idea of looking inside to see I forget how you said it. You wanted to go into psychology because you wanted to understand the emotions that you were feeling. Mm -mm -mm. And, and so, I mean, you, you were at least looking at them, which is kind of impressive, really. I mean, because many of us don't. Many of us go, wow, I feel like hell. Where can I go get a, you know, a dopamine hit, right? Or, or worse. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I would like to take credit for this. However, I think once again that in our responses to our emotions that we, we pretty much learn from what we're exposed to when we're young. Okay. Okay. So I guess in that sense, I was fortunate in a way that I was not exposed to that partying mentality or chasing ecstasy mentality when sure. I was young, but I was just exposed to keep your nose to the grindstone. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I'm sort of repeating my childhood just like everyone else. Sure. You know, I had a conversation actually just last week um, where I was told that much of our feelings of self-worth are established by about eight months it, I mean, does that, does that ring true to you? The way I say it is it's before age eight and during puberty is when we build the big highways in our brains because that's when we have a lot of a chemical called myelin, which is um, what makes the big pathways. It's like paving on your neural pathways. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest of our lives, we use these pathways because they're so efficient. And they're up to like a hundred times faster. And oh, the I simple, see. the simple way to understand it is when you speak your foreign, you, when you speak your native language, you don't have to search for a word. Of course, aging, you know, changes that. But, but the words come I so know nothing easily. Nothing about that. Yeah. So when you speak your native language, the words come so easily that you don't yeah. realize that you had to learn it. But if you try to speak a language that you learned in adulthood, you have to search for words because those are little pathways rather than myelinated pathways. I see. So it's the same with our emotions. We just flow into the emotions that got wired when we were young. I see. For, forgive me for a... a diversion into into biology i, I want to i want to remember this because myelin i remember is a sheath around neurons right and so so you're saying that that the pathways end up i mean literally being paved because you've got a myelin sheath that goes between uh, i guess among neurons yeah so as you say um it's not literal paving because it wraps <laughs> sure. around them. But sure. it is literally the same as if you have a wire and you have yeah. insulation on the wire, that the electricity flows through it faster. Sure. So each neuron gets wrapped with myelin, and when it's activated in, your, in those years when you have a lot of it, and then the electricity flowing through that neuron it just sips so fast that we experience that as the truth. Like this yeah. feels true and right and normal to me because that those neurons developed when I was young. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So I know at some point you ended up teaching at a zoo. What is the story? What is the story there? So, um, I took early retirement after 25 mm -hmm. years as a college professor. I could, didn't love it, but I could <laughs> excuse myself by saying that 25 years of doing anything is enough. Oh, absolutely. And so 
that's when I had a lot of free time. I retired very young at 50. So I, tr I started just following my interests. And that's, I had already had the idea that the animal brain inside of us is what explains everything. And so I read a lot of books about animals, and a lot of the research came from field biology, which is hard to do. So being a volunteer at the zoo is uh, a way to do that. And they sure. had a really good training program that taught me a lot, and that was fabulous. But zoo animals are really very lazy, so you don't really see that much. <laughs> sure. What got you on the pathway, no no pun on that, but what got you on the path of thinking that the animal brain would explain, say, your own behavior and emotions, I think, is, is more my question. Sure. So I was reading a lot of psychology books, and over time they had more and more of the neuronal aspect. Okay. But so often they mentioned this monkey study here and this monkey study there. And so then I just started going for straight primatology, books of monkey studies. Sure. And you probably remember, like, chimp studies were a big thing, so I read all the books on chimp studies. Okay. And um, interestingly, like I said, we're um, influenced very much by what happens in adolescence. And I remember that my first two, the first morning of my first day in college, I had two psychology classes, and they both used a lot of monkey studies. So, oh, um, interesting. yeah, so that was very deep in me, also. Yeah, yeah, and and forgive me, I forget how this works. I know there are three distinct regions of the brain that we fi figure developed evolutionarily, you know, over over mole uh, eons, I suppose. But there's the reptile brain, and then. In the on top is our is the human brain. Is it in between? That's the animal brain. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, reptiles, of course, are animals. So um, okay, good in point. In between, I'm sorry, is, reptiles. I didn't yeah. mean to offend you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's um, this, uh, I call it the mammal brain because, okay. like you said, they're um the reptile part, and then the middle part. So in academia, it's called the limbic system, and academics reject this tripartite brain theory. There's, as you may have known, like a kind of a nastiness between the new agey view of the brain sure, and the academic sure. view of the brain, but neither of them fit my work. <laughs> neither of them like my work. So, um, but the mammalian limbic system, people have heard of the amygdala, the hippocampus, mm -hmm. the hypothalamus, um, but it's not the individual parts that matter. It's when you put them together that almost, uh, so all mammals have this almost exactly the same. And it includes the reptile brain because ma all mammals evolved from reptiles. Sure. So what makes mammals different is that they are capable of cooperating, unlike reptiles, which never cooperate. So that's what's interesting. But this has grown into the misinformation that mammals cooperate. But the fact is that they have conflict most of the time. And it's just that they're capable of cooperating oh, in very specific situations. I see. So, so the, the work that you've done I mean, you mentioned around puberty, we start building these these big, deep neural pathways. I don't know if that's a good way to say it, but close enough. Yeah. A deep neural pathway. That, so that is a a, a demonstration of of neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, right? I mean, we've started with tons and tons of neurons in our brains when we're when we're infants that ultimately get pruned away, and then by the time you hit puberty, now now we're building deep neural pathways i'll keep saying so so that's a somewhat of a demonstration anyway of, of neuroplasticity am i am i getting this right i'm that's more of a question at this point yes 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 but okay. um many people speak of it as if it happens from a genetic blueprint and it doesn't it happens from experience, experience. so each time a neuron is activated 
it develops. And the more it's activated, the more it develops. So a simple example is that a Chinese baby will never learn Chinese unless it grows up listening to Chinese. So there is just zero. A Hungarian baby will never learn Hungarian unless it... So it's the experience activates the neurons, and each time they're activated, the connections between them build. And yeah. that's what makes the flow of electricity that we experience as knowing what's going on. Right. Can I, I mean, this is a total tangent, but I'm curious. I'm presumably you've seen some of the research around the idea of a male brain and a female brain. You presume you've, okay. So like, what's your thought on that? Because what you've mentioned is that our brains develop from experience. And, and for what it's worth, I've written articles around this, you know, that, that neuroplasticity pretty much negates the idea of a female brain and a male brain because it's still more an experience. So let me stop talking. What is your thought on that, if you have one? So I don't focus at all on male brain or female brain or male hormones or female hormones sure. um, because so many people are doing that. And, and Everyone who's doing it has a bias, and there are a lot of agendas. And uh, I yes. mean, I grew up in a world where women were always trying to prove that their lives were harder. And so I know that that's, that's the, the thrust of a lot of this research. But I grew up hearing my mother constantly talking about how her life was harder. So I always... Mm -hmm felt bad for my father because he was getting yelled at like me. So I had more of an identification <laughs> with him being the, you know, the one with the hard life. But other people have had a very different, you know, experience. Like my father had to get up and go to work every day and my mother sure. didn't. So I, sure. so anyway, um, Underneath whatever is male and whatever is female, there's this universal. So the universal is this. So we all have dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin. And these make animals feel good. They make us feel good. They motivate behavior. And people might find some small differences, but at the core, we all have this core. Sure. Do we... Are we able to choose against that? I mean, yeah, let me stop. Are we able to choose against that? Well, the core that we have, you know, it, it often, like, if you leave your dog with a whole bag of food, then the dog will eat the whole bag of food. So if you leave me with a whole bag of food, I can choose against that. So every minute of every day, we're having to choose to when to act on our impulses and when to not act on our impulses. And the impulses are mostly learned, but based on this very limited physical core, which is like, you know, when you're, when you're hungry, you're highly motivated to get food. Sure. When you're sure. thirsty, you're highly motivated, you know, to get water. Okay. And so your method, the inner mammal, method. Could, could you explain that briefly? Sure. So we can build new pathways in adulthood in the same way that we can um, uh, learn a foreign language in adulthood. But very few people do learn a foreign language in adulthood because it takes so much repetition to mm -hmm. build new neural pathways, and it's sort of unfun. So it's, <laughs> it's the same with people who have a behavior that they don't like, that it may be with wired in from very deep, repeated early experience, sort of like their foreign, like their native language. Mm -hmm. So, in order to build a new pathway, first you have to be very specific about what new behavior would I like, what new emotion or thought pattern would I like. Um, and just like learning a foreign language, it's like such a big task, you can only learn one word at a time. So what new thought pa pattern behavior would I like? So you're focusing on the positive, and then I have to repeat it. So how can I make a goal of repeating it every day for 45 days and know that it will get easier after that, but it's harder in the beginning, just because it's hard to get the electricity in your brain to flow into a new pathway. 
Mm -hmm. And and much of our behavior is running away from what makes us feel bad, not trying to establish a habit that feels good. Is that yeah, that's the fascinating thing is running away from what makes us feel bad. That's a, a good summary, but it's in animals, it's simple. If I'm hungry, I run away from hunger by finding food. If I'm okay. thirsty, I run away from thirst by finding water. Oh, but right. in the human world, it's more complicated. Like if I use the example, if a child fails a test, how do you run away from the bad feeling of failing a test? Well, studying sure. would be nice, but... <laughs> from the educator, thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> So, well, let's use another example. If a person wants to lose weight, so let's say that they don't like their appearance. So sure. they want to run away from the bad feeling of not liking their appearance. So there are a million different ways to do that. So one, yeah, I, I don't want to use the example of losing weight because people obsess over that too much. Right. We could bring up gender dysphoria, but believe me, we don't want to open yeah. that can of worms yeah. either. So here's but, a good example. Okay. Video games. Okay. Yes. So I, this is what I use in all my things. So if you have a bad feeling about something and you play a video game, the video game instantly stops the bad feeling. So it's not addressing the, the bad feeling at the core. It's not sure. solving it at the core, but it works. And your brain learns from whatever works. I so see. if you played video game when you were young, you wired in like, whoa, that works. Yeah. So here's another, like, if you ever known people who gamble, it's so mm -hmm. sad because they really, you know, hurt themselves. And then they keep doing it because at some period when they were young, they won at gambling Right. And it solved their problems. So their brain says, yeah. oh, this is a way to solve my problems. Yeah. So, so if I were to rephrase what it is I said, then we don't, we don't run away from what makes us feel bad. We, we go toward what makes us feel good, and, and it just automatically negates whatever it was we didn't want. Does, is that closer to the truth? Well, what I was trying to say is that running away from what makes you feel bad is a natural, normal, healthy thing. Like when okay. a gazelle smells a lion, it runs away from it. So that's why we all run away from stuff, because it really is a very core natural impulse. It's just in the animal world, when they run away from a bad feeling, it's like the bad feeling of hunger motivates them to do the hard work of finding food. Sure. But if you could have a shortcut, like, I'm hungry, what would be a fast, easy way to, re to meet my natural need without so much work? <laughs> then in the modern world, we have so many of those options. I see. And in shortcut, I like that. I like the use of that because it kind of implies that you're not necessarily going towards something healthy. You're just going towards something which, as you said, works. So so how do we, I mean, you've mentioned repetition, but how do we overcome that? So Sorry. repetition is question. not Sorry. fun. So none <laughs> of us wants to repeat the, the desirable new behavior or thought loop that we'd like to have. So I suggest that we re reward ourselves for repeating the healthy choice. And it's an art to find rewards that are healthy. Sure. Um, but I recommend everyone, if you can participate in an animal training class, because an animal training class, they give the animal like a tiny little reward for a tiny little step and mm -hmm. they do it over and over and it works and so we we need to reward ourselves is what you're saying every time you do that new behavior you get a reward oh okay suddenly this is thunking home so so then you end up associating the behavior with the with the reward that made you feel good and that's how you end up with neurochemistry that makes you feel like physically better. Is that, is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah. But it's not like one thing, you know, there's so many, there's so many little things. And so, um, each, it's so hard to build one new neural pathway and there's not one habit that's going to like, but sure. if you could figure out, you know, what is that negative thought that you're telling yourself the most and then say, what positive thought would I like to replace this with? Right. But it's hard because if you use a positive thought like I'm king of the world, then that's, you know, not going to be a good life <laughs> pattern to guide sure. you. <laughs> Bit bombastic. So at a dumb curiosity, the, the myelination then of the original neural pathway, does that get absorbed in some way? Does it get torn down and, and moved? No, we wish. Really? Um, it's always there, okay. um, which is the simple example is of like alcoholics relapsing. Sure. But the more branching off of it and alternatives you build, the less likely you are to flow there, which is again with the cliche of an alcoholic having one drink. And it's like another person who's like, oh, that person reminded me of some bad experience I had in the past. So the, the pathway's always there, but the more you stay away from it, the less you activate it. I see. So, so would the inner mammal, inner mammal method be more, can it be made more effective by finding more and more things that more and more activities that divert you from this poor behavior from the wow yeah yeah it's in yeah and i I wouldn't even necessarily say poor behavior but like i say the unwanted behavior sure and the unwanted thoughts and feelings sure undesirable like in my case like i thought everybody was mad at me because my mother was always mad at me so I thought people were mad at me even when they weren't. So, sure. Oh, yeah, true. Because you know? it becomes, yeah, it becomes a normal thought. You end up going, well, they, you know, somebody closed a door too loud, so they must be mad. I hear what you're saying, yeah. So, I mean, what did you, how did you address that? I mean, did you come up, let me stop there. How did you address everybody is mad at me? So the first step was to notice it. And Mm. that's like really scary because, you know, in your conscious brain, you say, well, no, I have plenty of evidence. They really are mad at me, you know? (laughs) And then the second step is like when somebody, therapists, etc., tell you that you're running on a pathway built in childhood, it feels insulting. Like, how dare you say I'm running on a path? So that's why I'm so focused on teaching people that everybody does this. This is how our brain works. And the good news is, so animals have no childhood, like what, it's a long, long story, but like animals have very short childhood. They're just kicked out of the nest. And that's because they're born hardwired with survival skills. But we have very little hardwiring because we're designed to learn in childhood. So we all learn from whatever our childhood is. Sure. And we, I mean, we also overthink everything. It's kind of our purpose in life. We go, somebody just closed a door too hard. I've got to overthink this. So, well, yeah, we're we're justifying because since I don't know that my childhood pathways have power, but our verbal brain is always trying to help out. And so, It's trying to come up with evidence to justify your feelings. So after I would talk to people, I would have a bad feeling. And I realized the reason for that, this is like help people dig back into that Earl, those early things that wired you. So often my mother would come in my room in a rage and attack me. And I didn't even know why. It was something I said a few hours ago or a few days ago. So I think that's why I would like, 
I would talk to someone and be fine, and then after, afterwards, I would panic that they were mad at me. Yeah. Do you... Were you ever able to have this conversation with your mother? Good question. You know, it's very sad, but I didn't figure it out until she died, uh, after she died. And, I, you know, I feel bad because I would have been more forgiving because the important thing is right. that she was wired by her childhood. I see. And she worked like hell to make my childhood better than hers. And it was much, 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 much better. Like, my only problem in life was her screaming at me all the time. But she had real problems. That is... I don't know. I think I was going to say that is beautiful that you are interested or willing or would want to, to forgive her for all of that. And to see it as, you know, this was... Her training, you got your training. I, I mean, because because my father was physically abusive to me when I was a kid, and I've had to, I'm I'm only just now processing that in the past couple of years, right? And he's been gone since I believe two thousand nine. That's probably a something I ought to know, but I kind of don't. So I'm sorry, father, but you know, <laughs> but. Well, you know, I mean, it was not a good relationship, right? I mean, you can relate with this. You know, I would imagine you did your own share of running away from your mother. I mean, I'm curious if travel, if that yes. was part of it. That you know, Look, I want to go <laughs> the other side of the earth from her. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's good that you are that you have processed some of this. But you were about to say something, though. Go ahead. Mm, I'm not sure, but um. Uh, in terms of, yeah, I felt very guilty about not forgiving her while she was alive. Sure. And I'm not saying that everybody should forgive. It's really, you know what the real thing is? It's like, it was never about me. Like, how did I not realize that before? But that was something, I was 53 when I realized that about my father. I mean, I remember writing in my journal, I'm writing along and I said, you know, I must have disappointed him from an early age. I mean, I remember writing that and then I went, <laughs> wait a minute, how the hell does a four-year-old disappoint, you know, yes, a parent? Yes, exactly, exactly. Like, it makes no sense. And then that realization, you know, came yeah. over me and I went, yeah, because it was Do you know anything about, about your father's early experience? You know, I from what I understand, he loved both of his parents. It was a great childhood. He grew up in Gardena there. Um, so I don't so know. It's possible, like, if there was bad stuff and he was covering it up, that makes a real deep cognitive dissonance, yeah. you know, yeah. because then you can't even admit it to yourself. Right. I mean, supposedly his father was very... You know, he was a very smart guy and worked at Disney, apparently worked on, I believe, Cinderella. was a, I think was an, an animator on Cinderella at one point. Kind of an interesting little story there. But, and I know he, I, he always spoke very highly of both his parents. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But um, did he feel like he was a disappointment to them? That's also a possibility. Oh, I couldn't say. My assessment of him, by the way, thank you for the free therapy. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect it, but you know, I, my assessment of him, and this goes back a few years now, but my assessment of him was that he really wanted approval from everybody, you know, and, and, and I ended up using that as sort of a, I don't want to use it as a, I don't want to say justification, but somewhat of an explanation to say that. If he always needed approval, everything, you know, the the control was always external. You know, he he lacked some some con a sense of control, maybe. And I'm making okay. it up. Okay. Oh, okay. So let's just go with, let's, no, the, let's just go with this theory okay. that his parents were, you know, okay, and but he wanted their approval, 
But deep down inside, he sometimes didn't want to do the things necessary to get their approval. So sure. he had this anger but couldn't acknowledge it. Mm. Now, an interesting thing is, um, I don't know if you've heard of Alice Miller. Oh, the name's familiar. Could you tell me so more? She was one of the hot psychologists about 20 years ago and then okay. fell out of fashion. So she was reviewing the German child-rearing books of 100 and 200 years ago. Oh, God. And their goal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their goal was to wipe out a child's will when they were young. Wow. And so if that were done to him, but then when he had his oh. own kids, he would say, oh, you have a will? So he right. would want to wipe it out. But yeah. then the part, the wounded child part of him was like very attuned to like that you had a will like whoa what's that so it was really like that part of him wanted to come out yeah. and every time he wanted to have his own will he experienced the terror of the consequences when he was a kid of having his own will and that terror like he projected all that onto you like, oh, my God, right. we're going to get in trouble. You're going to get me in trouble because you have a will of your own. People are crazy. That's the <laughs> bottom line because we're <laughs> wired in childhood. So sure. everybody is crazy. Do, do you know one of the, the, um, <clears throat> one of the big things that struck me about that story is that 100 years ago, 200 years ago, there were books on how to raise children. Oh, yeah. I didn't yeah. get one. How come they don't hand those kinds of things out? Well, I mean, maybe not those 200-year-old German ones that say wipe out your child's will. Oh. But I had no idea there was a way to, like, learn how to raise a kid and, and maybe it actually be effective. You know? Well, see, everybody disagrees with everybody else's <laughs> method. And now right. there's a new method. And I don't agree with the new method. And my daughter okay. is thinking I'm evil for not supporting the new method so sure. the new method of course as i already tried it is let the kid run wild because sure. you're going to the other extreme of you don't want to be mean and so now right. everything is mean so you say the kid knows better let them do everything for themselves and who knew that this would not make people happy is because it's like the dog who would eat the whole bag sure. of food if you let sure. them it, I, you know, I find that, I find that technique interesting because what I've noticed, at least with my own son, is he really loves at least some structure. Exactly. I mean, as a great example, and I don't think he's listening, but because he's upstairs right now on spring break. But I go upstairs. I'm like, listen, I'm about to get on a podcast. Did you eat lunch? And he goes, Yeah, I had something. And I said, What? And he goes. It was like a, a just a snack. And I go, I know, but what is it? I asked, what was it? And uh, and they say, um, it was a fruit roll-up. And I go, oh, that's not a lunch. Like, go get, you know, go get a real lunch, right? So I walked out afterward, and I'm like, so what are you eating? He's got bread and butter. <laughs> so I'm just going to have a butter sandwich. I'm like... I'm going to have to make you lunch, aren't I? But it was it was the bag of food. You know, it's like, I don't know, I'll open the, the refrigerator. Anything I like. I like butter. I'm just going to eat a stick of butter. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's the thing that, like, from the inner mammal perspective is to make it fun. So mm -hmm. you first, you model. Like, you're making his lunch. You're making your lunch. But you're enjoying it because oh. while you're doing it, you're turning on a podcast you want to listen to or music sure. that you like, and you're doing it maybe artfully so that you're enjoying making the lunch, and then you're modeling that for him. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's going to be 2 o'clock by the time we're done, so I don't know. By the time I get up there, maybe he's not going to be hungry. But, but in the long run. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. Thank you for that, too. I've gotten therapy, child-rearing tips, 
if I had known this, I would have reached out to you like years ago. Believe Thank me. You. This. Was... Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. So, um, but one other topic, if you don't mind, if we could talk sure. about, um, let's call it generally dating. Okay. okay. So, well, the idea is like people are crazy. And then when two people get together, they bring all of those old needs Sure. And then they, when the need is not met, they are annoyed with the other person. Mm -hmm. And yet the other person could never possibly meet the need because the need is really a neural pathway that you built when you were young. And even people who had a good family, ch children feel weak and scared because they can't meet their own needs. So we all sure. start out with this weak and scared core. The older you get and the more capable you are of meeting your own survival needs, the more aware you are that you're going to die. So that weak and scared core never goes away. So the other person can never make it go away for you. So. Great point. <laughs> so would, <laughs> All right, so what do you do then? Now you've got dating advice in this one, too. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm glad I'm not dating. It is, um, it is, <laughs> I, <laughs> there's no... I know, right? <laughs> there's no easy answer, but I'll tell no. you what blows my mind. When I understood that animals are picky about who they mate with, and they compete like crazy to mate with the cool ones as <laughs> defined by... In each species, it's defined by a specific characteristic. And sure. people have all heard about the peacock's tail. But every right. single species has it. Like, people may have seen, like, an orangutan where they have these cheek jowls. Uh -huh. Like, whichever one has the biggest cheek jowls, really? all, all the females want to mate with that one. Okay. And then the other ones get ignored. So, like, this is the harsh fact of life. Yeah. And so, this, like, teenagers, if they live in the most comfortable, easy life in human history and don't have to deal with the real hunger and pain and lice and cold that our ancestors had to deal with. So having a crush on someone who doesn't like you back is the worst pain oh, that they've ever... devastating. Yeah. yeah. But then... Their brain sees that as an actual crisis because our brain is designed to deal with crisis. And if you don't have a bigger crisis, that's what gets wired in. Oh. So, so this is, you know, the complication of life. Yeah. It also totally explains why I never got a date for the longest time because I was never one of the cool ones. Well, what I learn so is that the cool ones pay a high price. Like, so. yeah, there, it's not fun to be cool. It's like work. Just like you learn that the peacock with the biggest tail, that's not fun. They sacrifice tremendously to have that. Do you, but sacrifice what? I'm not sure I understand. Let's, let's go with the peacock. What, what is the, the peacock with the biggest tail? What does he sacrifice? So in general... Um, and, oh, and the peacock with the biggest tail, and let's say the, the biggest antlers, the deer with the biggest antlers. Sure. Okay. Okay. So it takes a huge percentage of their body energy oh, sure. to grow the antlers or the big tail. Right. So then they have less energy for other things. So that's the oh. first thing. And the second is they're less able to run. So the peacock with the big tail is more likely to be eaten by a predator. So he's in a hurry to make as many babies as possible fast. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that's. The... Yeah. And the, the deer with the biggest antlers, you know, ends up getting caught between two trees as well. Right. So he's trying to run and, oh, you know gets dazed i don't know how that's going to translate into audio but pretend i had big antlers and ran into a couple of trees and i'll move on i think let's move on yes so I... getting a day so is to have realistic expectations that's my solution to everything is yeah. instead of having these like 
I'm going to make up for all my past pain by having the biggest, best tail or antlers is like, I'm going to have realistic expectations. Sure. And then I'm going to have realistic expectations of a date. So, by the way, I mean, when even if we're talking realistic expectations, <clears throat> other aspects of what we've talked about, being able to notice when we go into a particular thought pattern or behavioral pattern, um, like this reminds me a lot of, of uh, psychology therapies, either cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectic behavior therapy. Not that those were ever, you know, applied to me, kind of they were, but do you like, would do you, let me just stop there. You're familiar with these these two therapies, CBT and DBT. Um, remind me, DBT. Uh, how how do you interpret it? Because I how do I, I in particular? <laughs> well, just give me a short explanation of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so you know, oh gosh. Oh well, I I don't mean to challenge you. I truly no, forgot. And it is too. I'm like, well, if you'd asked me about cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah. I think I could have done something. But so let's pretend I didn't mention DBT. Okay, I that think just dialectic is to challenge hard. to challenge your repetitive thoughts. I, Oh, I think you may be right. Oh, gosh. You know, you Which may be is right. Sort so that's of just like cognitive. Yeah, right. Well, but cognitive behavioral therapy, the idea is to notice your behavior, right? And to be able to say either this hurts or it doesn't. I mean, there's an aspect of the, um, what's the catchphrase? The Teflon mind in that? Is that what Marsha Linehan came up with, I believe? Um, yeah, I, I didn't do that one because... Right. Um, yeah, so that's because she was, that's more folk, it was focused on borderline personality disorder. Sure, sure. And that's very specific, so that's why I'm focused point. on it. But I'll but, tell you my, my story about this. I don't please. know if you've heard of Albert Ellis. Have you ever heard of yes. Albert Ellis? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, see, I'm an expert on all these pop psychologists from mm -hmm. decades ago. Right. So... He invented what was called rational emotive therapy that cognitive sure. behavioral therapy is based on. Yes. And he was great. And um, he had an open house every Friday in Manhattan where he would sit on stage and he would invite someone to come up and he would say, what's your problem? And they would get one hour in front of the whole audience. Oh and he gosh. would do two people every Friday. And it was fabulous. And his whole point of everything, and he, he, he was often, you know, aggressive and confrontational. That was his style. But it was to show people how they are creating their own negative thinking. So sure. with cognitive behavioral therapy, it's not just about your behavior. Cognitive is what are you telling yourself? That's the yeah. cognitive part. Yeah. So, and I mean that this, this actually, which, which your work does then is, is not necessarily focused on thought, but the, the acceptance that some of these things are not coming necessarily from thought. Yes, and, Exactly. Exactly. And so I think of, the verbal uh, part of our brain has much less power than we think. I, oh, I say sure. that we think it's the showrunner, but it's really just the narrator. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for all of that, uh, all of that discussion. I am curious if, if it's possible, and I mean, you feel free to just shut me down with like a no on this, but I'm curious if we can, <laughs> if we can relate the the mammal the mammal brain ultimately to our own patterns of identity i mean sooner or later you knew i had to go here but cuz i see you know identity in in my parlance anyway is a complex of physical characteristics uh cognitive characteristics behavioral and also spiritual where do you think the mammal brain how does that play into that, or, or, or does it, maybe? Well, animals obviously don't have the abstract 
kind of identity sure. because sure. they don't have that part of the brain. So what what blew my mind and is like informs the way I see everything now. So animals are very competitive. Like I mentioned, they compete for mating opportunity. Sure. But they're always measuring their strength against each other. But they don't want to fight because if they get injured, they, they don't have doctors, they can die. Right. Right. So the way they avoid fighting is by checking each other out. We call it social comparison. And they instantly know I'm stronger than that one or that one is stronger than me. And they then have this awareness of where they lie in the pecking order. I see. And all of this, you know, knowledge in every species, and it comes from farmers as well as researchers. But researchers don't do it anymore because it violates this peace well, and love view of animals. Sure. But for 100 years, all of this was known. Like, if, if we're in a herd and then... Our herd gets broken up for any reason. Now we all have to fight each other again, and then I rewire my sense of, okay, I'm stronger than that one, but I'm weaker than that one. So when there's food available, the strongest one goes first, then the sure. next strongest one, then the next strongest one. And I know that if I go too soon, I'm going to get bitten by the stronger one, and I'm yeah. not going to do that. And that's a bad feeling like whoa I don't want to get bitten but I'm hungry so I really want to go for the food so as soon as I see I'm stronger than all the ones that haven't gone yet I'm like yay it's me <laughs> so that's the feeling we all want is yay I'm stronger than you and that's serotonin so okay. we're all looking for like how can I how can I feel like I'm the one that's got it going on and there's no easy way to do that because as soon as you get it, the chemical is metabolized. And, and you also get habit habituated. Like if you are on the cover of Time, person of the year, that feels great for a short time. But then your brain's like, OK, now give me something else. Sure. So this sure. is we all have this struggle. It's, it's part of life. Yeah. Can could you remind you brought up serotonin in particular and oxytocin i th i thought and maybe i'm wrong i thought oxytocin was released when you've been injured and so it was like a painkiller endorphin of types. endorphin is the, in, injured okay endorphin is the body's it, endorphin sounds like morphine and that's why it oh, was true. named that way so that's okay. the once release when you've been injured Oxytocin is the one that is called the love chemical or the bonding hormone. Mm. And oh, oh, in the modern okay. world, we've gotten this idealized, warm and fuzzy community, you know. But if it were that simple, then everyone would have it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's so interesting to know that animals have a lot of conflict in their groups. And a simple way to understand it, I just visited a goat farm. So goat, when goats stick together, all the grass around them has been soiled. And if they eat soiled grass, they get intestinal worms and they die. Ooh. So they don't want to be in the herd all the time. They want to spread out. But when yeah. they spread out, uh, a predator is going to eat the one that gets isolated. Yeah. So they fear spreading out, but they fear sticking together. <laughs> so you see how... We have that same push-pull all the time. Yeah, yeah. Boy, life sucks. Yes, that's, you got it. <laughs> and But isn't it great when you know this, that you know that every single person yes. has the same dilemma, mm -hmm. and then it's not real. <laughs> yes. Funny, that ends up being sort of the, the message that I give, that each of us has to go through this process of pain. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't want to be proved right. I Life does suck. Well, that's a shame. Well, no. N well, <laughs> but I, I, I think if you learned when you were young, hopefully, that we all have these push-pull feelings. Right. And if you take a bad feeling as a crisis, then you're going to have constant crisis. So you have to learn that a bad feeling is not a crisis. 
gosh, you know, that turned around life sucks so much better than I was going to be. Because I was like, can we end this on a little more positive of a note? Can we just pretend, you know, life's good? But no, the point is life is bad, but how we respond to it can still be positive. Well, and also these bad feelings are just chemicals. It's cortisol. Sure. So yeah. if, if, if you slam the door and my cortisol is released, that cortisol is going to make me feel bad for an hour. But I did that to myself. That means I have power over it and I can stop doing it. Do we, we have that much power over it? Like over well, that's, like, that's what I said. We do, but it's as hard as learning a foreign language. All right. All right. All right. That's, that's rebuilding the, uh, the pathways. Oh, my gosh. One that, pathway at a time. But that's a great example to start with just slamming the door. Mm -hmm. So I could say, the next time I hear a door slam, what am I going to tell myself? Mm -hmm. So I could tell myself... Amy was in a hurry. She, or Amy was being polite. She thought I wanted the door shut. Or <laughs> sure. I could tell myself my ears are hypersensitive. It really wasn't slammed. Whatever. And then each time, you know, then I just relax about it. Yeah. Jeez. I wish I had another hour to talk to you, but, but now we're out of time. Thank you. Dang. Well, how about um, if you want to read my new book, Why You're Unhappy, and then we can do another. I think that sounds like a fabulous idea. <laughs> I will send you a free PDF of the book. And okay, um, okay. and the Kindle That'd is cool. only two ninety nine because I oh. really want people to read it. Yeah. Why you're unhappy? Biology versus politics. Cool. Oh gosh, yeah. When you throw in politics, um, it's the how... politics of the of why we've been indoctrinated sure. to see unhappiness as a disease. Oh my gosh! Do you know? Oh, shoot, because I wrote something similar to that. The idea that we pathologize just plain being human. Oh, dang, if I'd known. Okay, next time. <laughs> next time. Okay. Um, how do people find you? So my website is innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. And I have a free five-day happy chemical jumpstart where you get one email a day for five days uh, explaining each of the chemicals. All right. And I will link that in the show notes for sure. Are there any other social media that uh, the people would be able to so follow? So all of my social media is on, there, is on there and I have lots of videos and um, blogs and infographics. Yes. And for people who like books, I have um, lots of books. Yes. Uh, I want to say to, on, on your media page, I know there are probably 20 or 30 podcasts, I'm sure. And then you've written eight or ten books so or so so yeah yeah so plenty of material lots of really good stuff um so i think on with that i will say thank you to our listeners thank you to loretta thank you so much and um i'm amethyst de herrick i was speaking with professor loretta bruning on gender identity weekly thank you thanks for the great questions bye bye <laughs>